All right, uh, my name is CCR Chagra, and welcome to In Conversation With, which is basically an idea that was invented today. And to start this entire uh, idea of uh, having these conversations, which are very free form, um, what we're going to do is um, basically we have no idea. Huh? Except why are we here? What is life? What is poetry? What, what is, it's just a conversation. We may end up talking about soup. There's some amazing soup here. We're at the National Beat Poetry Festival. This is the year 2023. And this sitting next to me is one of the, one of the most important literary figures of our time. And, I, and, and let me get a bubble. Okay, he's a humble human being and a beautiful soul, and I am so proud to know him in my life and have crossed paths with him. So what we're just going to do is absolutely, like I said, have no idea. What's the first thing you want to say about anything at all? CC, it's good to see you again. It's good to be here with you as always. It's an honor, and uh, here in beautiful Connecticut, Central Connecticut. No, we're northwest corner. Northwest corner. Northwest corner of Connecticut. Okay. We're in Litchfield County, and we're in the town of either, uh, let's see, I think she said we're in either New Hartford or Bark Hampstead. There's a lot of water, a lot of trees. The Farmington River runs through here. Farmington River runs through here, so yeah. we may be over the line in another county. But anyway, we're here and now. So, yeah, I get the love. And, right. uh, so uh, the Bone Man dances circles round the subterranean gloom, paints pink and blue and purple until he fills the room with the smell of roses and uh, pandemonium, Moon. What do you want to talk about? I'm, I'm an open book. Um, pandemonium. I've lived so many... Here, I'm going to give you two words and I don't know where they're coming from, but see what happens. Pandemonium and love. What happens? They're, um, synon they're, they're the same. They go together, oh. pandemonium and moon and, and, um, and love. Um, because when have you known love? I'm talking intimate love now, not love and love of the human race, I'm talking about love with another person. Um, when have you known that when there wasn't at least some pandemonium involved? Um, and in, in my experience, it's a, a storm. Uh, love is a storm. And there's havoc. And, but there can also be peace and harmony, and uh, so I've been blessed in this, my third marriage, to, after the first two years of pandemonium, to experience ten years of harmony and a mutual respect. Um, that's a, a love I haven't known before, so, and I'm thankful for it. It's a blessed gift. So, I I have a, a a time in my life where I did not think I was ever going to find that there was no one for me, and a lot of people I think feel this. Yeah. That I'm just too deep a cookie. I'm too intense. I went too far. I've jumped off of cliffs, out of airplanes. I've splattered on the ground. I've got backing up again with no reality, no backbone. No bones, no muscles, no tissue, no form, and somehow I just came back up through it again, and there I am, living in my body, and I just start with one. And my way of doing that was there was something planted in me when I was through my father and my grandfather, whose name I carry, that was honest. Yeah. It was just honest. And yeah. then I learned in time that, that uh, honesty is not the truth. And yeah. it's not even the trust, and I think that's the pandemonium that happened to me, that I had to survive the end of love and never blame love itself. Right. Never blame, love didn't do you love someone on either end of the spectrum that's that right. you mentioned, Ron. And, and, and to hear you say that and to know your journey from just maybe, I don't know, I think your, your name crossed my plate, I think, uh, during, the, um, during the filming of Who Owns Jack Kerouac. When you did uh, when you did your poem, I will not bow down, which is a signature piece 
by this man. And you know, when you live your whole life and you're gone and then maybe a little something lasts like Shakespeare, most people know like three lines. The guy's known around the planet for four centuries, but most, most people you say, what did he do? And they have three words in his line. That poem is one of, one, of the, one of the things I think you left that will endure time, okay? time itself. And, uh, and, and, and it's a testimony to that no matter the pandemonium of life, no matter how much we suffer as a life form, as a species, as individuals, no matter how much we're knocked down and out, if we don't let that in, that's yeah. how I interpret I will not bow down. Yeah. You have to, on some level, participate in your own demise. You have to give that kernel of your mind away to, to a form of, I think, psychological slavery. Yeah. In some way, in order to be have that part of your mind enslaved, and that's the demise. Do you see that happening? And what? How important is poetry in that story? For, can you answer both? Um, can, well, are you good? Poet, poetry has always represented freedom to me and freedom of spirit, freedom of expression, and salvation, poetry is salvation in my life, in my experience. Mm -hmm. And so ideally, that's what I've always hoped love to be, is freedom, spirit, salvation. So there again, just as pandemonium and love go hand in hand, so do poetry. And, but poetry represents all of the above. It's, I met the real Santa Claus. I did a, on a Finland and Estonia tour in 2014. I was the featured poet at four international arts festivals. And, and Ravia Nimi in Lapland, um, inside the Arctic Circle, I was taken to meet the real Santa Claus. And when I walked into the room, Santa is, is it genuinely a woodsman story? No, this is <laughs> okay. Go ahead. This is this is a real deal. I mean, it's a real. There's a, there's a film they made about the woodsman saying that was the original. I don't, I don't know. Uh, go this, on. Go this on. guy said, he, this Santa said he was the real deal. Okay. And I was inside the Ar Arctic Circle in Lapland, so it uh, sounds good to me. So <laughs> Santa said, he said, what's your name? I told him, Ron Whitehead, what do you do? I'm a poet. He said, let me hear a poem. So I recited the poem I recited earlier, which I titled The Bone Man, The Bone Man Dance in Circles. And then I said, okay, Santa, let me hear one from you, a poem. Santa looked at me and he said, life is poetry Poetry is life. I said, that sums it all up. Thank you, Santa. You said it all right there. <laughs> it's a fantastic poem. <laughs> but it, life is poetry. And poetry is life. And it's up to us poets to take the experiences of life and to shape them into words that best represent the experience by employing all the tactile senses and also bringing in um, that extra sensory perception and experience that we, some of us have, that poets have, must have to feel and sense what lies beyond the material world. And so the world is not just um, a material being. Uh, it's also a spiritual being. Are we talking outside of time too? From, from my experience, and it's multi-dimensional. Um, and 
we dwell in multiple dimensions simultaneously who knows how many but uh, can I, can I uh, right where you are in this sharing that you're giving us um, should we be afraid of different ways of interpreting not just death but different ways of interpreting what dying or end of life means. How does fear and death come together in understanding that there's more than this physical couch and chair and body and bones? Uh, what is it about the end of life and no fear? That's my thing. So I'm going to see, do you, I mean, if you resonate with that, yeah. can you go there? Yeah. <clears throat> fear is... Um, born of insecurity, uncertainty, um, and so one of my goals, I can only talk from, share my experiences, talk from my own personal uh, life, what I have known, and I became aware early on that I've got to face and embrace my fears and new fears arise daily, nightly and each time they do instead of running from them I face them and do what I can to discover the source of the fears and I have some practices uh, I have daily practices, affirmations, visualizations, prayers um, that help me. Those are tools, mental and spiritual tools that help me overcome fear and align my energies with the creative forces of the universe. And a whole lot goes into that creative forces of the universe, spirit guides, guardian angels. Change is the number one universal principle and creativity is the shortest distance between two points. It's uh, mm. And it's what creativity, the creative imagination, is what provides hope and continuation of my being, of our beings, of this world, of Mother Earth. The whole world is made up of um, some of my primary goals in life are to use my poetry as my primary vehicle of communication to uplift and inspire to comfort and heal, and to awaken myself and everyone to the awareness that we all have a non-stop river of creative fire flowing through us. And we have got to do all we can to keep, to allow that river of creativity to flow, to honor the thoughts, ideas, images, and visions that come to us and I started doing this a long time ago, when that happens, uh, when I get a visual image, when it comes out of the blue, um, a word, a line, a poem, an idea for a project, a book, an album, a tour, um, then I don't just let it flow on by and fleet away. I, I say thank you, thank you to the creative forces of the universe. Whoever's responsible, whatever is responsible for bringing me this creative idea, and I begin the process then of writing it down, typing it on the keyboard, um, and then I do all I can to help it reach fruition 
in the form of a poem, a story, a book, an album, an event to produce something that might hopefully uplift and inspire and comfort and heal and awaken other folks and engage other folks um, in a way that they will be, they will want to be creative in their own way and find their own original voice if they haven't already. No matter what they love doing, um, follow that love to what their heart is directing them towards and live their lives accordingly. I built a bridge uh, 40 years ago. It took me eight years to build it from doing jobs I hated or certainly didn't want to do to put to earn money to put food on the table to pay the bills and it was a miserable life because I've been a poet all my life and then I got married for the first time and um, started a family and I made the decision. I had a near-death experience and I made the decision that I would not wait any longer. I would not put off living and being my dream any longer. So I made a pledge when I came out of that near-death experience. I made a pledge to the creative forces of the universe. I said, okay, from this moment forward, I dedicate and devote my entire life and being to, first of all, building this bridge from where I am to where I want to be by taking one step at a time so that I am my dream. And I did that. And for those eight years, and then for many years after that, I slept three hours a night. I drank 15 to 20 cups of coffee a day. I worked two jobs sometimes three. I went back to school. I raised three, helped raise three kids. Their mother did, of course, as well. And, but now, when I made that decision and I made that commitment, I had that light that hadn't been there before at the end of that tunnel on the other side of that bridge. And so I could do anything and I was relentless and I was determined and I had learned the value of hard work by growing up on a farm and being forced to learn it whether I wanted to or not and it has paid dividends on my life because determination determination and hard work are central to success any form or fashion please going through yep okay no problem through. we're and, lucky to have the space go on yes and um, so I got to the end of building the bridge. I had built a bridge, and so my life has never been the same since. Doors that I had knocked on before and beat my head bloody on because they wouldn't open, they remained locked, suddenly opened without me doing anything, without knocking. Sometimes I didn't even have to turn the handle. I was directed in, to certain people, places. Synchronicity became a guiding light and living force in my life day and night. And I followed my heart, the truth tester. I ended up in no time. Um, I met, had an encounter, received a message from and touched the Anna Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull, the main of, I think it's 13 Crystal Skulls. And, um, and so do, more doors started opening. In no time I was meeting and starting to work, becoming friends with and starting to work with members of the Beat Generation, since we're here at the National and International 
Beat Poetry Festival. Um, Diane De Prima, Allen Ginsberg, Mary Baraka, Gregory Corso, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the list, David Amram, the list goes on. And it, so I worked with those folks for years, the last 20 years of their lives. Of course, David at 92 is still going hard. And, uh, but I, I work with so many others as well. The Dalai Lama I wrote a poem with the Dalai Lama. I met him as a result of the synchronous energy with Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And uh, I'm sorry. Just, just go, go right ahead. ahead. I'm but, actually going to be we're, heading we're, out we're after this. Oh. All right, we're in the middle of the interview, but you can cross over. We're good. Go ahead. I don't know any other way. Okay. No. Nope. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back yeah. yeah it's, it's, we're laid back. We're good. Um, and so. In my, my life, everything that was going on in my life intensified. It sped up well over 100 miles an hour. And um, um, and I was going nonstop. I taught college for 20 years. I was, at the same time, producing three or four poetry events every week, publishing three to five new titles every month. Um, I was, I had the goal, on February the 4th, 1992, I said, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna found a global literary renaissance, a home based in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's gonna spread all over the world does that have a name? That that was in Louisville, Kentucky, is where I started that, and and so it. Does the Renaissance have a, a word or? A, the Global Literary Renaissance. Oh, the Global. It is called. Started, that is the name. I started. Oh, is that is the name? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and uh, published titles by many famous authors, poets, and writers, and up and coming poets and writers, and many of those limited edition titles are going for hundreds and thousands of dollars now on um, uh, eBay. Google it, yeah. And so all of that was going on and I started producing events, music and poetry events, arts events, including non-stop 24, 48, 72, and 90 hour non-stop music and poetry insomniacathons first in Louisville and then spreading out to New York City, to New Orleans, to the Netherlands, uh, produced the second one in Estonia uh, this past May, the 24-hour one. Good to see you, Lee. Uh, You're not going to stick around? No, okay, next time. We'll work it out. Sweet um, dreams. We're at a festival. Go ahead. And um, and so, and each one of these insomniacathons is I set them up intentionally so they are temporary autonomous zones where people can come and stay the entire time if they want to. They can come and go, but food, drinks, whatever they need is there, and and be uplifted and inspired by music and poetry. The first open mic poetry reading I produced with Kent Fielding in Louisville, over 400 people attended it. And two musicians came up in the middle of it and said, would it be okay if we performed a song? I said, of course, please go ahead. They did and I saw the energy in the room change. And I knew in an instant that from that moment on, my events would include both music and poetry to bring two different audiences together um, and introduce them to new voices, to new energies, out of which 
newer energies are, through inspiration, are created. And so the work goes on and whether my name is associated with it or not, like the poem I wrote with the Dalai Lama in April of 1994, Never Give Up. Half the time, that poem is all over the world now. It's in two of the Dalai Lama's books. It's been on banners, um, behind the stages at rock shows. It's going go anywhere. The, the <laughs> mosquitoes go for a third eye. Please knock, knock off any mosquitoes that might land on me. Um, anywhere the Dalai Lama is, and monks and others have booths set up with the poem Never Give Up on banners and posters there. And as often as not, my name isn't even on it. And um, after I wrote the poem, my attorney said, you have got to trademark that poem. You'll be a millionaire. And I said, look, I'll get back with you tomorrow on that. And so I thought, I already knew um, what my answer was going to be, but I slept on it. And the next day I told her, I said, this was a gift through some kind of spiritual transmission to me from the Dalai Lama. And I feel like Johnny Appleseed. And the most important thing to me is that this message in this poem, never give up, no matter what is going on around you, never give up. Develop the heart. Too much energy in the world it's been developing the mind instead of the heart. Develop the heart. Be compassionate, not just for your friends, but for everyone. Be compassionate. Work for peace. In your heart and in the world, work for peace. And I say again, never give up. No matter what is going on around you, never give up. And, and so I said, I want that message in that poem to be shared with as many people as possible regardless of whether my name is on it or not. So I don't want to trademark the poem. The Dalai Lama blessed the poem and blessed me and gave me permission to publish it, of course. And um, so I've been sharing it ever since May of 1994 a month after I wrote the poem and met the Dalai Lama the first time at the 48-hour non-stop music and poetry insomniacathon I produced for New York University. They asked me to produce it to kick off their week-long 50-year celebration of the Beat Generation. Um, and then I did a Northeast tour after that and I've been sharing it with people ever since. And I have uh, published posters of it in my Published in Heaven poster series. Um, Allen Ginsberg in his Howl and Other Poems book, published in 1956 by my friend Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Um, Who lived to be 101. He's gone. He's just he's a, he was almost made it to 102. Died year before last. And I was blessed to work <laughs> with him. I thought you were filming or something. We are. Come on through. Are you filming? Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. in a documentary. Come on through. Walk by. Come on through. Okay, there you go. Women Susan. speaking here. Go there right you go. ahead. And um, so I was blessed to become friends with and do a lot of work with Lawrence um, for the last 20 years of his life. And I worked with Ginsburg on a number of projects from 92 until his death in 97. And I in, in many conversations with both of them, but in one with Alan, I said, Alan, I would like, I know that in your, it's the forward or introduction. William, William Carlos Williams wrote the forward, I think, in Ginsburg, the introduction, and Ginsburg mentions the primary books um, that birth the beat generation and he says all these books are now published in heaven and I said Alan I would like to name my publication series 
published in heaven, posters, books, chat books, audio, whatever. And he looked at me and his eyes lit up and he smiled real big and he said, I'd be honored. So uh, Ginsburg was one of the people I published all the beats. Like I said, Seamus Heaney, John Updike, um, Bono, the lead singer for U2, Robert Hunter, the lyricist for the Grateful Dead, Lee Ronaldo, a friend of mine, guitarist for Sonic Youth, um, Jim Carroll, author of the Basketball Diaries. Um, the list is long. And I work with Kent Field and the young man from who lives in Alaska. He's a teacher there. Uh, we've started working together again on projects. Uh, I worked with him in those early years. He's a hard-working young guy, good guy. So, anyway, here I sit all these years later with CC doing this interview. After 2019 to 2021, for two years, I was named Kentucky State Beat Poet Laureate. 2021 to 2022, lifetime Beat Poet Laureate. No, excuse me, U.S. National Beat Poet Laureate. And then last year in 2022, I was named Lifetime to the End of Time Beat Poet Laureate. All of which I'm deeply honored by because all of my life I have considered myself to be in the direct lineage of outsider poets and artists going back to Homer. Mm -hmm. um, all through time, and in particular, as a young man in my teens, I was inspired by the British Romantics, uh, starting with William Blake and then William Wordsworth and Shelley and Keats and all the others. Come on back through, and then um, and then the American Transcendentalist and Walt Whitman, who is not actually an American Transcendentalist, although. Um, they lived at the same time. That's, that's come on through. No, no, come on through. Come everyone on through. has. No, it's come, an on, open, come on through. Karen. You're in a, you're in a documentary. Um, that's our host. And, <laughs> and so, um, and then, you know, right some of the same time Whitman was writing, a lot of people don't talk about this. People sometimes ask me, who's your favorite American writer? And I have so many favorite writers and poets, it's just hard to start anywhere. But sometimes I'll say Mark Twain, and they mm. look at me surprised, like, why? And, well, his books were entertaining, his stories were fantastic, he was brilliant. And he, like my friend Hunter S. Thompson, was uh, had a deep and dark humor. Um, he was a great critic of society, there you go. but but he was the first person in our country to have slaves and hobos as his protagonists of his stories. Who had done that? And. Um, and so he's part of that lineage as far as power. Not enough people say what he just said in those words. That's an important thing. I've heard no, a lot I, about I haven't, I haven't heard that's anybody a, say that. Yeah, that's, that's, so, that's the best thing because people bring up the critique and did he and didn't he and why did he and should he have, but that was articulate. Just as Hunter S. Thompson is directly related, connected with the Beat Generation lineage, and energy, and he was friends with him, and I had talks with Hunter about the beats, and um, he thought the world of them, and they were great inspirations to him. And we talked about the central players individually and their impact on him, and uh, how they inspired him. And, uh, and you know, Hunter was, of course, he could see into a person or a situation in an instant mm -hmm. and and know where to go, what to say, how to act. Um, 
I call it my blessed curse. That's intuitive. It's an intu it's an intuitive thing that's not easy to navigate if you're touched with it. It's lightning fast, lightning yeah. fast. And I consider Hunter S. Thompson and the Dalai Lama both to be great teachers sitting on opposite ends of the teaching spectrum. Mm. And Hunter's more like that Zen master who will walk up behind you when you're falling asleep while meditating and smack the dog shit out of you on your back to wake you up. Uh, because that's how his writing and his personality were. Um, but, but there is a lineage in the Beat Generation um, following the footsteps of the people I've mentioned already. And then, of course, um, there are others. And Bob Dylan, I consider him to be part of that lineage, and then Ann Waldman and Ed Sanders and Ed's still around, right? Yeah, I gotta Ed, go Ed's see still him. working in Woodstock. He's still at it. And then a lot of people don't. I consider Shane McGowan to be one of the great poets of our time. Um, Tom Waits, Shane McGowan, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen. But Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan is modern day Homer, as far as I'm concerned. He's just one of the great visionary poets of all time. A lot of people haven't heard his poetry. There's a book like this called Bob Dylan Lyrics that I luckily enough came across and have. And it, and it has uh, one of his poems, and I forget the title of it because it's been so long, but when Jack Powers was still alive, yeah. he had an annual event. He should like to do it at the South Church over behind Beacon Hill. And for three years in a row, I read that, that, oh, fantastic. that poem for fantastic. him because he really appreciated it. And it, it's rarely heard. And it had what was one weird thing about reading another person's poem that you admire like that. That and p p The thing about Dylan is that he lived his lightning bolt life. Yeah. And it's in that lightning strike where all of his work is. He didn't have to do much after that. Yeah. And I think being put on that kind of pedestal and that kind of fame and that kind of recognition, I think you don't want to be, you don't want to be looked up to, you want to be looked at person to person, eye to eye and soul to soul. And that's the only and way, that's, to, and that's the only way to look at people, doesn't matter who they are. Yeah. Mom and daddy taught me, I come from a long line of farmers, coal miners, and strong women, mom and daddy taught me to never look up to or down at anyone. We're all in this together, eyeball to eyeball, shoulder to shoulder. And what I've discovered over the years is that people who have become famous, most the ones I've met anyway, admire and respect being treated just like a fellow human being. You know what? I, 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 I got. I have almost, that's how I met you. And and I could have been intimidated. Oh, I'm about to meet Ron Whitehead. I'm going to talk to him. And here's David Amram. I've known David Amram since uh, we went, you know, he used to do the open mic at the Kerouac Festival. And then there's the documentary. You can't, can't, can't do this without mentioning Jack Shea and the documentary Who Owns Jack, Sher Jack Kerouac, which is, which is more about the soul of, literature and our passage through that divine yeah. that divine passage we embody yeah. it with our lives and our time and we come in and out of it and what jack shea did with that film was it was a documentary but it was really an art film it was yeah. really amazing what he did it's one of the most important films made on jack kerouac who owns jack kerouac um and it's vanished yeah we, uh, there's the story of how and what what happened to it but it does exist and uh, it has to, just like the documentary itself says, eventually it will belong to the public domain. Yeah. Because whoever wants to own and control the grave of fame, yeah. the, 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 instead of art coming from the bottom up like it did from the slave song, like it did from the slave song into all music in a way, I think I, I like to attribute the slave song to the, to the essence of it. But, but in the eye to eye and soul to soul, subject matter here on the table here in this conversation which i think my listening is my conversation i'm not the greatest listener but when it comes time to listening to a conversation sometimes that is the conversation because we could speak to ourselves alone and really we are 
this conversation I'm having right now is me in my own mind talking to myself. And if no one hears me, I better not be lying inside that world, inside my two ears, be below my skull. And that's what he, I think he mentioned when he talked about do the heart. Because that's, that's really where, that's, that's your audience. Your audience is your heart listening to your mind. And don't lie to your heart, you know. I when think I that, had the awareness, the epiphany, somehow when I wrote that poem with the Dalai Lama, Never Give Up, that the heart is the truth tester and the mind will take us down every rabbit hole it can. So we best run our mind through the heart um, and test, check the ideas that we have um, as far as whether to follow them, pursue them further or not. Um, and that's the, that's the avenue through which our intuition speaks to us. So I think it's enough for me. You got more people to talk with here. Yep, so basically uh, this is the brainchild of life tapped me and said, go do this thing. You don't know what you're doing and you don't know why you're doing it. But it is the first of something and people need to hear poets besides just them reading their poems. The people inside this person who takes this journey. And whether you're a poet, a prophet, a mystic, or a sage in that journey, you're a being first and foremost. And, and, and where you are in that world is your relationship to, which was the beginning of the question, if we could wrap that up, because he just gave all that to you, talking about, in a way, death. Yeah. Because that was the initial thing, and he did this, and he only mentioned death once in that little thing that I was listening to. And I say little because this is just a blip in time, and I hope you made it all the way through when you share this. And that is uh, that death is just the moment that he had the epiphany. That it, he, your near-death experience was the fulcrum point, so to speak. That's I love right. that. I love That's that right. And I wrote recently about to conclude this, aging and dying are as natural as being born and being a rambunctious young person running wildly through the yard in the fields during a thunderstorm. Um, it's just, it's part of life, dying, and there's nothing to be afraid of there, regardless of your beliefs, overcome your fears, and face death boldly with peace in your heart because a new adventure awaits us when we die. Mm. This is Ron Whitehead. My name is C.C. Chagra. And this is In Conversation with Thank, thank you. you very thank much you, young man. for helping me birth a baby. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.